good to see everybody um, this morning. This is actually kind of a good lead-in to what we're going to talk about. We're in the middle of this bless series and talk about how we are going to um, um, bless the people around us. And if there's a trait that dominates our culture today, it's this. And I really think this. No one is listening. Politicians do not listen. And quite frankly, from my perspective, don't care about the life, the needs of the people, and do not particularly listen to the people. We use, or a lot of people use, social media to shout our views about everything. And we all know about how effective that is, how many people who read a post in social media and changed their opinion overnight. We are divided into camps right now, and we do not even entertain the other side. And we live in a very divided kind of world. It's endemic to our time and place. And I'm wondering if Jesus has something to teach us. What might really happen if we listen to each other? It has been noted that in his ministry, in his recorded ministry that we have in the Gospels, Jesus asked 307 questions to other people. And he only answered questions a few times. He listened more than he had the desire to speak. He asked far more questions than he answers questions. And he always seems poised to listen. So I thought, what if we dug into some of the stories? I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read out of Gospel of John. We're going to read out of three different stories, but just to start, just one story. It's the well-known stories of John chapter 4. This is the woman at the well. And in verse 7, we read this. When a Samaritan came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You may be seated. I'm going to talk about three stories. I just started with that one. I'm going to talk about Nicodemus. I'm going to talk about the woman at the well. And I want to talk about the woman who is caught in adultery. The first one, even though I just read out John 4, I want to read, I want to talk about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Jewish leader. He was a respected teacher in all likelihood. He probably was on the ruling council, the Sanhedrin of the time, and he'd have been looked to, he would have been looked to for guidance and wisdom and all those things. But then he runs across Jesus. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen, I have not seen all of them. I don't even think I've seen many of them. But if you are a fan or have watched many of the Chosen episodes, one of the ones that are deeply impactful is when Jesus has a, the extended conversation with Nicodemus. And the reason why I like it so much is I think it really captures a little bit of what was seemed to me plain in the story. Nicodemus was interested in what Jesus had to say at a very deep philosophical level and theological level. But Jesus spoke in terms and in ways that I don't think he readily understood. And what Jesus did is he took time and entered into a lengthy discussion with him. It is in the middle of this discussion um, that we get the well-known verse, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's something that happens when you take time with somebody. Someone said this, and I, it's been rattling around in my brain a little bit, and I, I think I agree. 
being heard is as important as being loved. And in fact, without being heard, you will not feel that you are loved. And I think one of the things that we have going on in culture right now is we have, from sea to signing she, and it's not just here, it's probably in other parts of the world too, very few people feel heard. Now, I think part of that's legitimate. Part of that is we've so isolated ourselves and, and got into our own little camps that I think we haven't created space for that. But we're just, we don't listen as much as we should. And one of the things we need to do when we get in touch with other people around us is we need to be sure that they feel heard from us. Listening to someone shows that you are engaged. And it shows that they care about you as a person. And our words are very, very important. And I think we all have to admit we're just not heard very often. Remember... If you're under a certain age, there used to be a day when you'd go to the bank and you would get out of your car and walk in and talk to a human being. And you would have to fill out a deposit form. Now you take a picture of the check and you, it all, and you don't touch it, you don't have contact with anybody. In fact, we can't even hardly get a human being when we call customer service anymore. How long do you have to stay on the phone before you get in contact with a person? It's a long time. And I think that creates almost like a sandpaper feel as we go through life. We live in a culture that's becoming increasingly disconnected. Even during our times of connection. I know I've mentioned it before. I know you've been in a restaurant and have seen a family of four sitting at a table, and all four are like this. There's no conversation that happens. We were already becoming disconnected from each other, and then that whole process went into hyperdrive four years ago. And almost cemented in, and we wonder why things seem to be going wrong. It's almost... Almost as if it was predictable. Nicodemus did not understand. Jesus had to spend time. In fact, his first attempt at understanding, he didn't get there. He goes, wait a minute. Are you telling me that I have to actually re-enter my mother's womb again? Jesus goes, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. So Jesus had to go past his initial misunderstanding and dig deep with Nicodemus. Now, here's the thing about this story. There's really nothing in the story that ever tells us whether Nicodemus rightly understood what Jesus was trying to say eventually. Never tells us whether he believed or came to faith or not. We do not know the results of this. And we're kind of left with this indecisiveness. We don't know exactly how the story ended. And I, I wonder if that's purposeful. Because when we enter conversations with each other, we don't know how those conversations are going to result either. We don't know if we're going to achieve understanding. We don't know if we're going to achieve agreement. We don't know if we're going to see things exactly the right way. And that's okay. We live in this disconnected world, and there are people around us who would love your time. Not your agreement, just your time. There was a young man that I've spent some time with through the years. Good guy, but spent some time with. A few years ago, he was ordained in the church. And that happened on Friday night. Now it's the next morning. It's Saturday morning, and we're having our business meeting at District Assembly. And I can't even remember exactly what it was, but there was something that happened that this young man who was just ordained didn't agree with and thought it shouldn't be that way. And I came out, and I saw him, and I said, You look a little... 
tense. What's going on? And he said, that, that's wrong, and someone should point it out, and I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to tell him. And I put my arm around him, and I said, I have two reasons why you shouldn't do that. And he said, what are they? I said, first one, you were just ordained last night. There's not a single person here that cares what you have to say. The second thing, I said, and if you go up there anyway, you will force me to tackle you in front of all these people. <laughs> and so he said, I believe you might. I won't do it. And I said, good. I'm just saying, sometimes our conversations were not always filled with roses and lavender. Just the other day, I got a thank you note from him that thanked me for my time. We don't always have to have exactness, exact agreement with people. We can exist with people and walk through life with people even if we disagree. But if we're going to affect any kind of change, influence, or anything, they have to know that we're invested in them and we care. So Jesus gave people time. Second thing he did is he, the woman at the well, I'm back to this story. He noticed the woman at the well. That is one of the most fascinating things in that whole story because the woman is at the well at a time and a place when she doesn't want to be noticed. It was right in the middle of the day. It was at noon. What do you mean? That's right in the middle. Exactly. Everybody would have gone to the well Right at dawn or in the evening, not in the heat of the day. She was there in the heat of the day because she didn't want to be noticed. And Jesus noticed her. The first act of love is giving someone your attention. Here's the trick. This woman was not looking for attention. Sometimes our attention is good, even if someone is deliberately avoiding it. A few years ago, Ryan had just started here. He was only about a, in his first weeks. And I don't even know how it happened. I don't think any door was supposed to be unlocked. I was down here showing him something, where things were, an electrical panel or something. And all of a sudden, we heard a voice and turned around in the hallway, and it was a young lady. And maybe 20. And she says would you mind if I used your phone to call someone to come pick me up? And we said, okay, sure. Is, you, is your car broken down, something out there? No, 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 I'm just, I need to find someone who will give me a ride home. And there was something off about it. And so we dug a little deep. And she said, we go, do you not have a cell phone? Yeah, but it's in the car. And In the car? Well, I was with my boyfriend, and I made him mad, so he kicked me out of the car and just drove off with my phone. She didn't want to get to that part of the story. We kept digging and digging and digging. And we said, um, are you safe right now? What's going on in your life? What decisions have you made? We started to have a conversation, and things started to break down, and uh, eventually... Uh, about 15 minutes later, the boyfriend pulled back in again, and we said, we advise you not to get in that car. <laughs> um, and she did, and we tried to follow up, and the first time she responded to the text, and then she quit responding after a while. My point is, she didn't want attention, but probably needed some at the time. I don't know what it was about the woman. Jesus saw something. Maybe, maybe she'd given up. Maybe she was deeply embarrassed. Maybe she was ashamed. Maybe there was a whole lot of things. She didn't want to feel the pain of how other people saw her. Now, there are some people today that say, what our task is, we just have to listen to what other people do and just go along with it and agree with everything that they say and provide exactly what they want to say and any disagreement with anybody else, and it's hating them. 
There is no more shallow viewpoint than that. This is dangerous, and it's not at all what Jesus did. Jesus dove deep again with the woman at the well. Oh, this is a perfectly human response. How many people in your life do you know that will not go to a doctor simply because they're fearful that a doctor might tell them that something's wrong? And unless a doctor tells you something's wrong, you'll be perfectly healthy for the rest of your life, right? doesn't work that way. There are many people who will refuse the treatment that will make them healthy. Won't do the thing that they know that they need to do. There are places and times when we should share. There are also times when maybe we should not. But either way, our neighbor deserves our attention. That's it, our attention. Even when we engage, sometimes we might not be giving our attention. I know that this has happened in every household ever. So I'm not calling anybody out. But it's often the husband will be sitting there reading the paper and the wife will say, um, you know, hey, I think the gutters need to be clean. There's a clog in the gutter and we need to get that before the rain. Uh-huh. You're not listening to me, are you? Yes, I am. You said there's a clog in the gutter and it's just above the downspout and before it rains, we should get the clog. Now, they repeated word for word, but the next thing is, you're not listening to me. I know that's not happened in any house here at all. And while there was, yes, listening, there was probably a deficit of attention. And often what people are looking for is attention. And that's in shortage. Jesus gave people his attention. There is, I ran across this quote, and it made me go, really? And I thought about it, and it was exactly right. It says this, the opposite of listening is not speaking. That's not the opposite. The opposite of listening is waiting to speak. And I thought, ooh, how many people use every engagement just to say what they want to say without stopping and actually engaging the words of someone else. That's what attention means. And we have a world that's looking for it. Here's a danger in life, and it's a danger in every single relationship we have. Much of the time, our desire to speak is greater than our desire to listen. Maybe we should wait until we have listened first. Because when we hear the words of someone else, we're hearing the person. The person's being revealed. This is a good standard in everything. This is a good standard in friendship. This is a good standard when you meet a stranger. This is a good standard in marriage. And please do not say, boy, Doug's got everything figured out in that marriage thing. No. No. Sometimes we all know things that we don't practice enough. It's a good standard for parenting. How often in the middle of the conflict, the teenager that comes back late, that does something, we jump in because I want to tell you what's on my mind when we should stop and listen first. There's always time later. We don't have to unload now. We can listen a bit. When it came to the woman at the well, Jesus gave her his attention. And it opened up a world that ended up in an altered life for the woman at the well. The last story is the woman who is caught in adultery. And it is one of the best known stories. It's at the very beginning of chapter 8. Sorry, um, beginning of chapter 8. It says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, my own first question is, she was caught, other translations, in the very act of adultery, and yet the woman is the only one being presented before Jesus. Something is missing in the story, but we'll go beyond that for now. 
They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? I like this phrase. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he said to them, As any one of, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. And again he stooped down. And it says, at that, those who began to go, they began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left. But he's still down low. Until only the woman was there. Then Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And he said, then neither do I. I want to stop there just for a second. We live in a world where most people have an unending stream of condemnation. It starts early. Some people hear it from parents or the neighborhood kids. You're too short. You're too tall. You're too skinny. You're too fat. You're too pimply. You have glasses. Whatever the thing is. Some people have the nature. It just rolls off their back. Some people really hear it. Sometimes I hear it from mom and dad. You'll never amount to anything. You're such a disappointment. And it just goes through life. They never get that voice out of their head. We go to work. Why are you late? You don't do it good enough. You're not a good enough this. And it seems like we know. And if you're like me, there are people that I see. I can just see them in a grocery store. And I can just see that they are pulling a lot of that weight all the time. I think this woman was one of those. We don't even know why this woman was there. Well, yes we do. She was caught in the act of adultery. She's a bad, nasty woman. Well, she was caught, but my question is why? At a time and a place where often, I'm not saying her case, if you were a young woman and if you had a certain family situation or your parents died early and you didn't marry the local Lord or whatever else, guess what? You might have, that was your way to eat. I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying we don't know why. We don't know if this was by choice, if she thought this was a good business plan, or whether this was for survival. We don't know any of those things. It's possible, it's possible that she didn't have as much choice in the matter as we would like to think she does. It's possible. It could be that this life was all that she knew. Again, possible. It could be that she wanted something different, but did not know how to verbalize it, or even how to think about it, or something she's never even conceived of before. This was just all her life from the beginning. It's possible. Even today, I've read statistics there are places you can go to in the country. There are demographics. There are neighborhoods you can go to that hasn't seen a wedding in generations. And then they say, well, you should just want to get married. It's not even part of their vocabulary. I'm just going out on a limb here. Whatever she was going through and whoever led her to that minute, I'm telling you, I have an idea. Jesus knew what that was. Condemning her immediately would have immediately placed her outside of Jesus' ability to change her life. And I think that's why Jesus stoops down. He wants to get right on her level. He doesn't want to seem like he's coming down from above, but engage her eye, eye to eye, face to face, and from a place of warmth and being alongside. There's another story, the woman with the issue of blood in Luke chapter 8. And we think, we read that, we think that's a health issue. Oh, I'm glad Jesus healed her. That was not a health issue. If she was a woman at that time, and she had a constant bleeding problem, she would not have been able 
to have contact with the community. She would not have been able to... Any chair in her house that she sat on, nobody else in the house could ever touch. Imagine the weight of that. The sheets that she used, no one else could lay on. If she had, let's say, a son that was like, said she's had an issue of blood for 12 years. I'm guessing, I'm going out on a limb, I bet she had a 12-year-old son at home that she was not allowed to touch. Imagine the weight of that. This was an inclusion issue. This was a, someone that's completely outside. So Jesus stops and whirls around after she touches the hem of his garment. And he, oh how cruel, he singles her out. And she was trying to hide. She was kind of coming in from behind, trying to make her way through the crowd. She didn't want to be noticed. Another one, she wanted to touch without ever being seen. Jesus whirls around, picks her out right away. Oh, and she thinks, I'm telling you, she thinks, oh no, here's somebody else that's just going to humiliate me again. I've had 12 years of this, and it's going to happen again. I bet she got that knot in her stomach. I bet the world just kind of froze. But Jesus had to address her publicly to lift her up publicly. When she went home from that encounter for the first time in 12 years, she could sit on the same chair as her family could sit on. She probably could hug her 12-year-old child for the first time. Think about that. With the woman adultery, Jesus stooped down. And I think, again, one of those reasons was to get down at her level. Sometimes today, the impulse is, you should know better. I'm here to help you. I'm here to lift you up. But let me tell you how wrong you are. If you'll listen to me, I can lift you up out of your wrong. And we wonder, people don't really listen. What if we got down on there at whatever level anybody is and then walk alongside? See, I think that's what's partially missing today, and Jesus did it great. We talk about it, but we rarely look people in the eye anymore. Sometimes, I know it's been said, there is some study out there. I've read some early stuff that generationally, this, the phones and the video games and the computers, there is a deficit of some being able to look people in the eye now. And that's, that's tragic. If we're motivated by sharing my truth or getting a good word in or they need to hear the truth, it's probably not going to work. But if our motivation must be to love and walk alongside then it starts a whole world that's possible. One of the reasons, and there's a couple, but one of the reasons why in the winter, like last evening and Friday evening, I was refing high school basketball game, is I'm in the locker room with a lot of refs. And... I like the fact that there's a week where I talk to people that completely come from a different viewpoint than me. And I get to go in and be subversive. And I like that. But it keeps, I don't know, a freshness. I like that interaction. I don't even know how to start. I don't even know how to start talking to people. Now, let me also say that... Um, there are people that do this more naturally than others. There are extroverts who naturally wade into a room and just talk to people. And I think probably a lot of places might even be dominated by introverts, and we can't imagine it. But if other introverts do not want to be, in, excuse me, do not want to be engaged by an extrovert, all those words, all those emotion, all that kind of stuff. But if we're just getting to know someone, here's just some ideas. I think what we need to do is we need to listen to people, let them tell you their story. Listen to their history. Ready for this? Where did you grow up? Tell me about your family. Oh, people are always willing to share about that. Good and bad. Get ready for an answer. You can start to know what makes them tick. Second thing is, 
Listen to their heart. What is your favorite blank? My question is, you have a day off, money's no object, what is it that you love to do? Oh, they'll tell you. Listen to their habits. Hey, if you have free time, what do you love to do with your free time? Oh, I like to fish. Tell me where's your favorite place to fish. Tell me what it looks like. Why do you like that place so much? What is it about that that really engages your soul? Oh, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. Trust me. Listen to their hurts. How are you doing? How are you doing with your mother? How are you doing with your brother? That relationship, you know, that's a little frayed. Let's talk about it and start. I know and I completely agree that the world needs to hear the gospel message. But they're going to hear that better if they know we love them. If we started walking alongside of them first. Now let me just tell you these stories. The woman at the well at the end of the story was the one that ran back into town to tell them about the man who changed my life and told me everything I ever saw or did. The reason why he had that impact on her is because he gave her his attention for a while. The woman at the well, sorry, not the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery after Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. And at the end of that, he said, listen, go and sin no more. But he didn't lead with that. But he started with things to let them know that they care. I say that because we live in a world right now, I'm convinced, that have a, has a deficit of people that care. And there's a deficit of being heard. Next, this coming year, 2024, are you, are you excited? I'm going to make you really excited. Are you ready? 2024 is another presidential election. And we have the very best to choose from. <laughs> you laugh. Well, there's a reason for that. Maybe what some people do is they segregate into their camps and camp over here is all people, um, you know, you have people over here who will only think about voting for Mr. Orange Man. And you have those people over here who will only talk to people who will vote for Grandpa Puddin' Pop. I'm being equal. What if, what if we as people decided that whether you're in camp A or camp B, that we're just going to love everybody in either camp? And we're not going to make you think like we do or vote like we do or agree with us before we'll go up and walk through life with you? What if we're just going to hug you anyway and go to lunch with you? See, we don't have a shortage of people in either one of those camps. We do have a shortage of people who love everybody anyway and engage people anyway. And if we're going to bless the world around us, the first thing we're going to have to do is start to listen to each other.